All right, tonight we for sure, I know I said this last week, but we for sure are going to conclude our series, little mini-series entitled Defense Against Deception, and tonight we're going to talk about false teaching. And tonight we're only going to look at Paul's writings because Paul uh, really established the doctrine for the church, and so we're going to look at a lot of the things that he said, and... Most of the things we're going to look at, matter of fact, all of it that we're going to look at was written by Paul near the end of his ministry. Much of what he wrote that we'll read tonight was written from a prison cell, and some of it, in fact, uh, as he is awaiting a death sentence to be carried out uh, on his life. And he leaves some instructions that we'll read to the church and to those who are ministers or leaders in authority in in the church government. And you can see very clearly as we go through this that some of the concerns that Paul has is deception that was going to surface or had began to surface in his time and would continue to rise and grow and filtrate uh, the move of Christianity and hinder the spreading of the true gospel, the gospel that was birthed with the coming of Christ and established with the foundation of the church that carried out uh, the Great Commission. So we're going to begin in Philippians chapter number 3. We're going to read a couple scriptures there, Romans, and then we're going to jump into uh, some of the writings that he gave to Timothy. And I was thinking back as I was going through these scriptures, and I've been raised in church my whole life, and I thought, you know, I really haven't heard a whole lot of sermons that have really just went through and focused on uh, the, the portions of Scripture that I picked because a lot of them that we're going to read, are they really are geared towards church leadership. But I, I believe that God is calling and raising up a bunch of leaders here. I believe that there are a lot of people that have uh, the gift of leadership. And I want to see these principles and these values in our lives so we can carry them over into our everyday life and guard against this real threat of deception, because deception comes in subtle forms, it's disguised, the Bible says, Paul says, uh, let no marvel for Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light, and those who are followers of him do so as well. So we want to be on guard, and we want to be equipped by the word. So we're going to do a lot of reading tonight, and let me remind you, we're in church, so it's okay to read the Bible in church, right? We're going to cover a lot of scriptures. I'm not here to entertain you, okay? I'm not here to build my ego or build my name. I'm here to equip you with the Word of God so that you can be successful in this life and you can be prepared for the life to come, okay? So I'm not here to impress you tonight, but I am going to go through a lot of scripture and hopefully you'll pay attention and you'll be awake and you'll take it in and apply it to your life. Some of y'all went like that when I said awake. So let's jump right in. Philippians 3 and verse 17, Paul is writing this from prison. He says, Brethren, be you fathers together of me. In other words, imitate me. Put into practice what you've seen in my life and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. In other words, he's saying, pay attention to my life and let me see those same values, that same godly character and that lifestyle that you live let it be seen in, in you as we have left an example. Verse 13 says, For many walk. Notice we have the, the word walk again. Let's go back. Verse 17. He says, Be followers together of me and mark them which walk so. Walk as Paul does in a godly manner with eternity in view. But he says, in contrast to that, there are many. Notice he says many. Many many of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross. And how is that? Because their walk doesn't line up with the doctrine of Christ, with the gospel that Christ gave us. Their walk contradicts what Christ illustrated and the doctrine that he was establishing through Paul here. He he goes on to elaborate, elaborate about those type of people who walk contrary to what the cross is all about. See, you need to understand something. When you embrace the cross of Christ, you pick up your cross. We don't hear that, do we? 
You know, we, we celebrate the cross of Christ, but how many of us have picked up our cross? Paul said, I die daily. I crucify my flesh daily. That's what Paul said. Why? Because he has truly embraced the cross of Christ. Therefore, he has submitted his life, every part of his life, not pick and choose, not buffet Christianity, every part of his life to the authority of God's word. And the good thing about it is we don't have to try to do this in our own power. Why? Because those of us who have truly encountered the cross have been given the Spirit of God. And because of the Spirit of God given to us, there is an expectation from God for us to walk in the Spirit. And we'll cover that here in just a moment. So that's what it means to embrace the cross of Christ. It means you pick up your cross, but you have the Holy Spirit who empowers you to carry your cross just like the Holy Spirit empowered Christ to carry His cross. Are you with me? Notice what he says about these type of people whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. What does it mean that their God is their belly? No, that's part of it. Whose God is their belly. It means they are controlled and dominated by earthly desires. They are controlled and dominated by earthly desires. Desires, who God is their feelings, their emotions. They live in the moment, they live for today, and they don't think about eternity. They don't think down the road. And here's the bad thing about it when we allow our belly to be our God, we're going to be deceived because it's all about how we feel. How many of you know you can't trust emotions? Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If you follow your feelings, you're going to be deceived because your heart in and of itself is desperately wicked. So why would we trust something that God God calls wicked? He says their God is their belly whose glory is in their shame. Who... Mind earthly things. To mind earthly things means to set their minds upon. They set their minds on the here and now. Fulfilling the pleasures of the moment. The pleasures of now. Not thinking of the consequences that will follow. And they live for this temporary world, which John clearly says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man loves the world, listen to me, guys, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father. James 4 and verse 4, I just feel a lot of scriptures popping up in my mind, says this. It says, whosoever will be a friend to the world is the enemy of God. So you got to choose. Are we going to be controlled by our earthly desires? Are we going to live for the pleasures of the moment? Are we going to let our lustful desires be out of control? Are we going to have self-seeking desires connected to this world system that govern our life and determine the actions and how we live our life? you got to pick and choose. He elaborates about this in Romans chapter 8. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Comma. He tells us what it means. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So let me ask you a question. People who live a life that is dominated by following their fleshly desires, are they in Christ Jesus? They're not. Because if you truly have the Spirit, if you've truly been born of the Spirit, then the the Spirit is working in and through your lives, and you will not habitually live a life dominated by fleshly lust and desires. It is impossible. We've, we've heard that misquoted a lot 
in church saying, you know, because, because we've prayed the sinner's prayer, there's no condemnation. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. It's not in your Bible. Look at the screen. To those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And we're going to talk about in detail what it means to be led of the Spirit in contrast to what it means to walk in the flesh. So stay with me. Now, I know this is not popular. That's why nobody preaches it. But I fear God, so I'm going to preach it, okay? Follow with me. Verse number 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. They tried to carry out the laws of God in their fleshly ability. They did not have the Spirit of God like we do. That's why a lot of the things that we see that happen in the Old Testament, it seems like God kind of cut them some slack. You want to know why? Because they didn't have the power that indwelled in their everyday life like you and I do after Christ's atonement. So we're without excuse, and we're held to a higher level of accountability under the dispensation of grace. How's that for good news, right? It's not a problem. If you have the Spirit working in you, you'll want to please God. You'll want to walk in His principles. You'll want to walk according to His laws. But it says that they tried through the law... And it was weak because they tried to carry it out in the flesh. So God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, He overcame sin so that we could receive the same Spirit that empowered Him to live a godly life. Now, godly doesn't mean long hair and long skirts. There's nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't define holiness or godliness. It's right here. Because as we've seen going through the life of Christ, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had an outward appearance of righteousness, but inwardly their heart was full of wrong motives, wrong desires. And they lived sinful lives. Even though they put on this facade, they were righteous before others. Okay? So Christ condemned the sin nature by overcoming it and giving us the Spirit so that we likewise can overcome it. Now, I have to ask you a question. Do you believe that the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives inside of us? I hope you do because Paul said that's exactly the case later on in this same chapter. Okay? The rest of that says that the Spirit will quicken our mortal bodies so that we can carry out the will of God and not be controlled and dominated by our desires. Listen to me. There's nothing wrong with a lot of the desires that we have, but what is wrong is when we allow those desires to get out of control. When those desires lead us and control us and form our decisions and our lifestyle, the way we live, that's where the problem is. Okay? Verse number 4 that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Notice it doesn't say those who, when they were five years old, prayed the sinner's prayer that that he didn't even know what they were praying. Got quiet in here. Okay? How many of you know it's impossible to be born of the Spirit until you're at the age of accountability? Are you following me? You can't make a decision to follow Christ until you understand, until you are the age of accountability. And I'm going to uh, talk here in the future. I'm going I'm to give, give a sermon about the age of accountability and, and that it's not necessarily us being born into sin like it's been portrayed uh, over the last 100 years or so. But we better not chase that rabbit tonight. Verse number 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind. They have their mind set on the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So a, a, a good way of examining whether or not you truly are born of the Spirit is to, to ask yourself this question, what do I think on? If I think on stuff related to this world, then I'm probably not born of the Spirit. 
That's what he just said. But if I, my mind is on th- the things of God, pleasing God, submitting my life to the will of God, then I probably am born of the Spirit. That's exactly what he's saying here. Now, let's, we're going to go to Galatians, and we're going to elaborate on more detail of what it means to walk in the Spirit in contrast to what it means to walk in the flesh. Are you with me? Galatians 5 and verse 16. Brace yourself because it gets a little bumpy. This I say then. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The answer to living a righteous and godly life is not focusing on all the wrong things that we shouldn't be doing. Okay, that's, that's what the law did. The law showed us what God's standards were, but the problem with the law was it couldn't empower us to carry it out. Okay, so Christ came, was filled with the Spirit of God, He lived a sinless life, and he has passed that promise of that same power to you and I. And when we receive, when we are truly born of the Spirit, we will walk after the Spirit. How many of you know the Spirit is truth? There's this harmony of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Okay? They are one and in the same. So to walk in the Spirit would mean to carry out the will of God in our lives. Watch what he goes on to say in verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. In other words, we have this war that's going on because we are still flesh. We still have a flesh body that has desires, do we not? And Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, that which is born of flesh is flesh. You're not going to be delivered from the flesh. You're going to have to deal with it until you leave this walk of life. So it takes a continual walking in the Spirit. It's not a one-time event. Walking in the Spirit is not a one-day occurrence. It's a lifetime commitment. It's something you live on a daily basis. Because there's this war that's going on. Notice what he goes on to say. But if. How many of you know that word if is conditional? If you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, what would this verse imply by the statement that it makes? If you're led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. But if you are led of the flesh, you are under the law. Right? If you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. But if you be led of the flesh, you are under the law. And how many of you know how much flesh will be saved under the law? None. None. That's how serious this is. Verse 19, for the works or the fruits of the flesh, you'll know a tree by the fruit it bears, are manifest which are these? And I want you to hear, uh, some of this is obvious. It's like, duh, it's in the list. But some of it's not going to be so obvious as to what it's meaning. Well, we're going to go through it. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? These are things we need to be on the lookout for that we see in people's lives that warn us that there may be some deception lurking in the shadows. Adultery. Everybody knows what adultery is, right? Fornication. The word fornication is the Greek word porneia, which means that it is not limited to just the actual physical act of committing sexual immorality, whatever form that may be. Man with man, woman with woman, uh, unmarried uh, individual with another unmarried individual, man with beast, whatever you want to, whatever scenario you want to draw it up. But it's the Greek word porneia, one of the, the, the most thriving industries in the world, one of the top five is the pornography industry. It's a real threat. There was a survey done that uh, was an anonymous survey, and it said that 30% of pastors anonymously, anonymously admitted, 30% admitted to having a lifestyle, a private lifestyle of porn addiction. That's in the pulpit. That's in the pulpit. 
And I, would, I think it would be fair to say some of them didn't tell the truth. Right? You know what? The ones that did tra- tell the truth, there's hope for them. Because they bring it to the light. And any time we have an area, listen to me guys, we all have areas of weakness. Every single one of us in this room. We all have inherited weaknesses that are more than likely generational. Thing, things your parents struggled with. Things your grandparents struggled with. Things that you're going to have to put under the power of the blood. And you're going to have to crucify your flesh daily. Or you're going to fall prey to that. And they may vary. The form may vary. So it takes us being submitted to and setting our mind on heavenly things and not the pleasures of today. Because there are real threats that are out there. Uncleanness. The word uncleanness means impurities. Impure motives. Like we see with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Doing things with motives and strings attached. Lasciviousness. The word lasciviousness means wantonness. It means a lustful indulgent with no restraints and no boundaries. That pretty much describes our culture. I'll do what I want to do, and nobody's going to tell me that I can't do it. These are works of the flesh. And if we habitually live a life that is dominated by the flesh... We will not see the kingdom of God. Translation, we will not be in the kingdom when the Lord returns. He goes on to say, idolatry. The word idolatry obviously means that we're not going to make idols that we worship, graven images. But it also means that we're not going to put anything as a substitute for God. Paul, on multiple occasions in his writings, very sternly and adamantly says that greediness, covetousness is idolatry. The love of money is idolatry. Our world is infected with the love of money, which is a form of idolatry. Witchcraft, the word witchcraft is the word pharmakeia, which is a life that is dependent upon drugs. Is that our culture or not? Did he say it would happen? He did. Why? Because there's still flesh on this earth. Okay? Hatred. The word hatred means hostility towards others in that you wish them harm. And there's a difference between not really caring for someone and wishing them harm. That's what it's talking about here. Variance. This means a contentiousness. A sower of strife and quarrelsome. I've known some church people like that. These people, the good, good, the good thing about it is we don't have to spend eternity with them. Y'all will get that on the way home. Emulations. The word emulations means a selfish jealousy. If it bothers you to see someone excel in an area you wish to excel, you need to be careful. You need to be careful. Because what I've seen a lot in a lot of people who operate in this is they begin to tear down people that are having success in an area that they wish to excel. We need to be on guard. Wrath means an outburst of rage. Outburst of rage. Strife literally means in the Greek selfish ambitions. Self desires to excel. Selfish ambition. Seditions, this is divisive teaching that causes sex or groups. Heresies, heresies literally means factions or parties. Today we would call it cliques. Cliques, I've seen a lot of cliques in church. 
Y'all are quiet. Envyings. That is the begrudging of others that have what you desire. I've seen a lot of that in ministry. Murderers. I think that's self-explanatory. Drunkenness. Any form of partaking of things that take your sobriety away from you. Okay? Things that impair your sobriety. Revelings. It's a party spirit. Party spirit. It's celebrating in one's fleshly achievements and accomplishments. How many of you know that that describes America? It's amazing how people will pay thousands of dollars to go to sporting events that last a couple hours. But it's hard to get the people of God to give to true causes that will truly build and impact the kingdom of God. And I'm talking the church globally, not here, but globally. Notice what he goes on, and such like. In other words, he's saying, I'm not giving you an exhaustive list. There are others to be included. Of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do, the word do there is the Greek word proso, which means to perform habitually. It doesn't mean if you've made a mistake, or if you've tripped up, or you've had a moment where you gave in to a weakness in an area of your life that God's just going to throw you away. But it says, those that habitually practice, in the Greek, proso, learn Greek and study it out for yourself. This is what Paul says, it's very strong. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God, which obviously is talking about the kingdom that is to come when Christ returns. They will not experience the kingdom of God. Those who give their lives to that. Now he goes on to show us an examples of what it means to walk in the spirit. In contrast to what we just read about walking in and being dominated by the flesh. And most of you should know. Him. But the fruit of the spirit is love. Listen to me. Love is not telling people what they want to hear and giving them what they want so they can be your buddy. Listen to me, anyone that you have to to tell them what they want to hear and give them what they want or they're not going to like you is not your friend anyway. Okay, we need to we need to get a good dose of tough love in America. Fruit of the spirit is love, joy. Peace. Peace. In a world of chaos. In a world of uncertainty, we have peace that passes all understanding. Why? Because we know what the Word of God says about God's children. Long-suffering, that, that, that means patience. Listen to me, if you're truly trying to live and serve God, especially if you try to do it in the church world, you're going to need lots of it. Patience. Gentleness. The word gentleness means literally kindness. Kindness, not a fakeness, kindness. Okay? A genuine kindness, a genuine care for others. Goodness, that's simply being good to people. Faith, with, let me say that, being good to people with no motives. This, this is not goodness. I'll pat your back if you pat my back. I'll lie to you if you lie to me. That's not goodness. Being truly good to people with no strings attached. That means if you do something good for them, that you don't have an expectation from them to fulfill. You know, a non-announced expectation usually. Are y'all following me? Faith. Faith. Trusting God, standing on His Word. When things go right and things go wrong. Because they will. Meekness. The the word meekness means humility. It also means strength under control. Humility. Means we're not proud. 
but we understand that we do have a strength, but we don't abuse it. Perfect example of it's Christ. They're mocking Christ, they're spitting on his face, and he could snap his finger and wipe the human population off of planet Earth, but he had meekness. Strength under control. He had all power was given to him in heaven and in earth. He could have got justice right then and there, but he had meekness. And he didn't do it because he was looking at the big picture instead of the circumstances that he was walking through. And the, the, the favorite of, 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 of our culture, temperance, which is self-control. Self-control. Those are fruits that will be evident in our lives if we truly are born of the Spirit. In other words, if we've truly been saved, the things that I just read will be naturally occurring in our everyday life. Why? Because a good tree bears good fruit. And Jesus said, you'll know a tree by the fruit it bears. Verse 24, watch what he goes on to say. And they that are Christ, those that belong to Christ, have what? Have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. So those who have not crucified the flesh and the affections with, with the affections and lust, are they Christ? What does Paul say? He says, they that have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust belong to Christ. Which would tell us those that have not do not belong to Christ. Verse 25. There's a lot of preaching that's out there that goes contrary to this. There's a lot of preaching out there that says you can do what you want. God wants to make us all rich so we can just live these lustful lives and just buy stuff like crazy and spend stuff on self, 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 self. Listen to me. You won't find that in the Bible. You won't find it. Not one verse. You won't see it in the example of how Christ lived his life. You won't see it in the example of how any of the apostles lived their lives. You won't, you won't see that. Materialism is not part of Christianity. And there's a hyper-prosperity message being preached. And and we'll get to that here in just a moment. Matter of fact, in just another verse or two, I'm getting ahead of myself because some of y'all are fading on me. But it's out of balance. It's been over the last several decades where you've had this crazy teaching that teaches, man, if you have a big house and fancy vehicles and all kinds of stuff, you're blessed. You're blessed of God. That's not true. That's not true. We never measure whether or not we're in right standing with God with a bunch of stuff that we own. How How many houses did Paul have? I mean, think about the patriarchs. Think about the people that we celebrate in the Bible. They weren't focused on this life. And that's what we're trying to do over the last several months, in case it hasn't been self-announcing and obvious, is to get us focused on living for the life to come. Because listen to me, I think it could get here sooner than you realize. And once it gets here, what's done is done. Where you are is where you are. When the trumpet of God sounds, it's over. And I don't want to have any blood on my hands because I didn't tell God's people this is what the Word of God says. I know this may be the noise that's out there. This may be the the popular message. This may be what are filling the pockets of, uh, of hirelings. But I want you to hear what the Word of God says. Are y'all okay? I'm getting fired up all by myself. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. In other words, it's not about us. It's not about us. 
It's about him. It's about his will. It's about his plan for our life. First Timothy chapter six. Are y'all with me? Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Do what? In other words, let every one of you who have a job honor those that give you a job. That the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. That's a shocker. What does that have to do with all of this? Talking about sound doctrine. Because we live in a world that doesn't understand authority and rank. They don't understand the kingdom of God. And it's partially because of the culture that we, we grow up in. But we live in a, a generation where people think everybody owes them something. And they shouldn't have to work for a living. Are y'all with me? And if their employer asks anything of them, if they actually ask them to work, they get offended or mad. And they dishonor and they complain and they gripe and they run them down. You know what God thinks about that? He says, you're blaspheming the name of God and the doctrine of God. That's pretty intense. Because I look back in my life and I thought, man, I've been one of those before. Before I was born into the kingdom and started understanding the kingdom way of doing things. Now, this doesn't mean, listen to me, let, let me talk to those who are on, on, on the top of that ladder. That doesn't mean you abuse people. That doesn't mean you take advantage of people. That doesn't mean you work people for an unfair wage. It doesn't mean you work people for something you're not willing to work for yourself. Okay? But we need to understand that we need to be submitted to those who are in authority. This is a principle of authority. Honoring those who are in authority. Not right here. Not honoring them right here. Honor them right here. Doesn't mean you're going to agree with everything that they they want or desire, but unless it goes against the word of God directly, you are to honor that. Verse number two. Let's try verse number two. See how that goes. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. That's what we're doing right here. Verse 3, he goes on to say, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which is according to godliness, godly living, a lifestyle of healthy and godly living that is eternally focused. Watch what it says about him. He is proud. He is a conceited fool, is literally what it says in the Greek. He is a conceited fool. He is proud, knowing nothing, but dotting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Man, he just pours it on them. Supposing that gain is godliness. Here we are in, in our culture, America, hyper-prosperity. Supposing that gain is godliness. How much stuff you got is a measuring stick for how spiritual you are. Because those are the blessings of God. What does he say about that? From such, withdraw yourself. From such, withdraw yourself. Let me translate that into the 21st century. Turn off the TV and grab the Bible for yourself. Are you following me? From such, withdraw yourself. He goes on to say, but godliness with contentment, godly living with contentment, being content is great gain. There's something to said to be said for people who will be content no matter what's going on in their life. People that are like this. On the mountaintop, in the valley, they're like this. Why? Because they're trusting God. And they understand that there are seasons of life. 
He goes on to say, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Watch what he says in verse 8. And I believe everyone else could say, man, I got some work to do there. And having food and clothes, let us therewith be content. But if we have food and clothes, Paul's saying we better have a good attitude. That's pretty tough. That's pretty tough. He goes on to say, but they that will be rich, those that have a desire to be rich, doesn't mean necessarily if you if you are rich, because God uses wealthy people, undoubtedly. But they that desire to be rich will fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And they usually don't see it coming and they usually don't realize it when it's happening. Verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil. The loved of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. Is it possible to err from the faith? <laughs> the answer is on the screen. While some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many Sorrows. I've watched it happen time and time again. People began to bring in lots of money and they become self-absorbed and self-consumed. And before you know it, their life begins to unravel because of what they're placing their value in. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Didn't we just read those in a list somewhere? Those are fruit of what? The Spirit. What's he telling him? Timothy, walk in the Spirit. Follow after the Spirit. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Are y'all, are y'all okay? We'll be out of here by 10. This know also that in the last days... Perilous times shall come, dangerous, stressful, hard, difficult times shall come. The last days begin when Christ left this earth, and they will be here until he returns. Those are the last days. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, which means literally in the Greek, lovers of money. Boasters, which means braggarts, proud, arrogant, blasphemers, slanderers. Disobedient to parents in any kind, any form of authority. Unthankful, ungrateful. I believe it's safe to say that we live in a culture uh, that is, for the most part, very ungrateful. Unholy. Refusal to live a set-apart life. Without natural affection. Without natural affection. When we throw babies in the trash, that is without natural affection. Y'all hearing me? When kids abandon elderly parents, that is without affection. When parents abandon infants, that is without natural affection. We see it in our culture today. Truce breakers, that literally means in the Greek, irreconcilable, unforgiving. False accusers, that means accusing others of something that you don't know that they've done and seen with your own eyes. False accusers. Incontinent, that means lacking self-control. Fierce. That means untamed and uncontrolled. There are people who pride themselves in being untamed and uncontrolled. They're rebels, right? 
That's not something to be proud of. Despisers of those that are good. It's always been that way. Cain killed Abel. The religious leaders killed Jesus. The one who was good was killed by the one who was full of envy, who didn't want to submit their life to God. It's going to be here until Jesus comes. Despisers of those who are truly good. Traitors. Betrayers. Jesus says in the Olivet Discourse that uh, many will betray one another. Love will grow cold. Heady. That means reckless and thoughtless. Irrational. High-minded. Puffed up, conceited. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. How would we know if we're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God? Do we spend, what do we spend more time and money seeking after and investing into? And that will tell us. Watch what he says in verse 5. Having a form of godliness. This, he's not talking about the world here. And, and God Listen to me, God's problem is not with the world being, being the world. <laughs> his problem is with His people bearing His name who are living like the world. Having a form of godliness, having appearance of godliness, just like in Jesus' day, they had a form of godliness, they had an appearance of godliness. But they were denying the power thereof. They were denying the message of Christ. They were denying the power of the grace of God. From such turn turn away. It's telling us the last days would be full of hypocrisy and pretenders. Those who live with the facade. Those who go to church. Sometimes every time the doors are open. And have an outward appearance of godliness. But their lives are not, not submitted to the message they go to hear. They have ears, but they don't have, but they don't hear. Just like in Jesus' day. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly, gullible women, laden with sins, led away with different lusts. This here, he's referring to an actual series of things that were happening in the church in Ephesus, where. These false teachers were teaching stuff that was appealing to the flesh and they were going in and they were taking advantage of gullible women who were buying into the message that they were preaching, just like today. Just like today. Preachers that take advantage of well-meaning people through false doctrine. Verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of of the truth. Learning, we live in a generation where we're learning stuff, but we're learning stuff that's not going to value us one bit in our walk with God. Even in the church, I've seen movements of people chasing information. What's the new revelation? I, it doesn't matter if it's made up or not. Let's just hear something new. Right? And it's driven by people who are using the pulpit to fulfill their ego because they want to be seen and heard. They want to be elevated because they have some new revelation that nobody's ever heard. Are you following me? And people flock to that. People flock to that. I said in Hebrew service uh, the other day that with the, the return of the Jews to their land and the revival of the Hebrew language, people have gotten interested in, in that. And that's great. But there have been people who have moved in the body of Christ who have seen that people are attracted to that So they just start making stuff up in that field and using it to merchandise the people. Are you following me? Because it's new content and they produce books and CDs and DVDs and it's just a bunch of hype and nonsense and speculation. And people who are real scholars who actually learn the language are going, oh my God, how are these pretenders getting so many followers with this garbage? You know what the answer is? The church doesn't know the word. And maybe 200 years ago, there was an excuse because there weren't printed Bibles everywhere. There wasn't technology that makes everything available. But today, right now, as I stand before you guys, we're without excuse. 
We're without excuse, and we as a church, we thrive on creating an atmosphere so you can learn, so that you can equip yourself, so that you can have tools and access to everything you need to know the truth. Why? So that you're not deceived. Because listen to me, I never want you to go home and bank everything on what I say from this pulpit. I want you to grab your Bible and take it open and study it in context and examine it for yourself. And take it and apply it to your life. Because I know this. If you do that with a pure heart, even though we may not agree on every little detail. Listen to me, I don't agree with what Daniel preached two years ago on every little detail. We're all growing. But I do know this. If you get hungry and thirsty for the Word of God and you do your own homework, you won't be deceived. You won't be deceived. God will honor that. And He will work with you with the knowledge that you have right day and today and hold you accountable to that. Are you following me? Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 8, Now as Jenez and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. This is a reference to the Egyptian sorcerers who mimicked uh, the turning the rod into a crocodile, turning the, the waters into blood. Uh, bringing frogs upon the land. But, but what he's trying to illustrate here is there was a limited amount of ability to mimic the true power of God. You can only fake it for so long. Verse 9, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. He goes on to say, verse 10, But you have, you have fully known my doctrine." Manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Didn't we read that list? You see it resurfacing? You think Paul's trying to hint something? But he adds some things. Watch what he says. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, at Antioch on the first missionary jail, uh, journey, there were jealous Jews who persecuted him, him and Barnabas, and ran them out of the city. At Iconium, they tried to stone him. At Lystria, they did stone him and left him for dead. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. That would fly in the, first, in the, in the face of the faith movement that we hear preached about. If you have faith, you'll never go through anything. He says, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. No, no, Paul, you got stoned and left for dead, dude. How's that delivering you? He's talking about his faith. My faith didn't waver. No matter what I faced, I was willing to face it. Because I had a calling on my life, preach the word of God. And no matter what it cost me, I was going to preach the word of God. That's what he's saying to Timothy. These are the fi- this is the final letter that he writes before he's executed. And he's telling Timothy, you need to follow in these things. He goes on to say this. And I've seen it in my own life. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall surf- suffer persecution. When I really dug in and tried to really submit my life for, for, for the Lord, that's when all hell broke loose in my life. I'm like, I am just trying to do what your word says, God. And this is not really all that fun. And Jesus said, I know. Trust me. I want you to think about it. Jesus, he never sinned. All he did is go around healing and saving people. And they killed him. And Paul says, I'm about to die, Timothy. And I'm just trying to leave you some advice. Here's my advice. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And an insult to injury, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. You know why that is? Because there's not enough people who are willing to be persecuted. To preach the truth. Therefore, it gives an open door for evil men and seducers to wax worse and worse, to bring in false doctrine and false teaching. Because listen to me, if you preach the truth, 
Not everybody's going to rejoice in the truth. I mean, you look example after example throughout history. The old prophets, Jesus, they came with a message that was incredible. And people try to kill them. And it looks like they got away with it. I want you to think about the day that Jesus died. He's on the cross. And the evil men and seducers are out in the crowd making fun of him. If you look at in that if you look at that in the natural, who does it look like one? In this life it looks that way. See, sometimes if we get our eyes fixed on this life, it's going to look and appear one way when it's really not. In the natural, it looked like the evil men won. But because he submitted his life to the death, burial, and resurrection, he has been given a name that is above every name. And he has been exalted above all. And those that were out in the crowd mocking him one day will stand before him as he is crowned in glory and honor and splendor. And they will bow their knees before him and they will say, you were the Messiah. But the sad reality is it will be too late. Verse 14, but continue thou in the things which you have heard and has been assured of knowing of whom you have learned them. And that from a child, notice what he points him to. And from a child, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works he's pointing him to the word of god and he flows into what we would call the next chapter but it's the same train of thought i charge you before god and the lord jesus christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at the appearing of his kingdom preach the word preach the word timothy be instant in season and out of season reprove rebuke Exhort with all patience and according to doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. It's today. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. And the last verse. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of your ministry. If you're familiar with this context, he goes on to say, I fought a good fight. Finished my course. There's laid up for me treasures on the other side. I know I'm about to be offered up as an offering unto the Lord. He knows he's fixing to be beheaded and executed. And the only thing on Paul's mind, the greatest theologian of the New Testament era, was Timothy, don't get deceived. Preach the word. Follow the examples that's been set for you. Preach the gospel of Christ. Don't waver. Don't compromise. Endure afflictions. Walk through persecutions. Make full proof of your ministry. Because it's not about this life only.